great to have all of you here. Uh, welcome to all of you and everyone who's watching online across the state. Uh, it's a real pleasure to welcome you to the second Leading Voices in Public Health uh, lecture for this semester. And we're really uh, pleased to have a, a, a real uh, public health hero with us today. About six months ago, I was in a conference in Boston, and Dr. Benjamin was on the panel in front of me. And I remember sitting there thinking, I'm an idiot, not just compared to him. But, but for 10 years, we've been doing this Leading Voices in Public Health, bringing in public health advocates from across the country. And yet, we hadn't invited the person who, for the last 15 years, has probably been the most visible and vocal advocate for public health in our country. And so I, I approached him, fully expecting him to uh, politely decline. He said, no, just let me know when. So he's here tonight. Dr. Benjamin was a, a Army physician, emergency internal medicine. Uh, when he got out of the military, he rose up to be Commissioner of Health for Washington, D.C., then the Secretary of Health for Maryland for a series of events. In the past 16 years, the Executive Director of the American Public Health Association, the largest association of its type in the country for public health professionals. But more importantly, it has been a consistent voice advocating for the health of the American people uh, for all of that time. So please join me in welcoming someone who we're very delayed in inviting, Dr. George is Thank you, Dr. Well, good evening, everyone. Let me, um, Randy, thank you very much for, for allowing me to be here. I can just tell you, the, the flight in was easy, and it's absolutely beautiful at this time of the year. So I'm really glad I had an opportunity to come and spend uh, uh, a few hours with you today. Um, let, let me just start. I, I like to define things. So let me talk about the definition of health. I absolutely love the World Health Organization's definition of health because it is holistic. Uh, in nature. Um, you know, as, as an emergency physician, it's painful to know this um, because it's certainly much larger than um, what I did when I was practicing medicine. Um, but it's an important uh, definition um, because it aligns physical, mental, and social well-being as a collective to um, define what we view as health. Um, and for those of you who have not seen this definition before, I just encourage you to do so. It's been around since about 1948, uh, and frankly is the definition that the whole world uses when they describe health. Now, as we think about that through the U.S. context, um, we certainly spend much more, as we know, than any of the other industrialized nations in the world, and we don't get the best outcomes. Simply put, uh, we spend almost twice as much money, and we die sooner. Uh, and that's a real challenge, um, because that tells you that um, no matter how much money we're spending, we're really not organized um, and utilizing our resources uh, in a manner that um, other nations with far fewer resources do uh, each and every day. And so, you know, I, we like, you know, we're competitive nations, so we like to com compare ourselves to other places. Um, and the Commonwealth Fund fairly recently tried to take a stab at the, the, the things, the big buckets of things that help define us differently um, than other industrialized nations. Uh, I think the most obvious one to all of us is that we don't have universality in terms of healthcare coverage. Uh, we are the only nation in the world, the only nation in the world, does not have universal coverage for all of its citizens. Um, now, understand, that does not say single payer, that does not define any particular model, but does tell you that there's lots of ways to get it, to get universality. And I continue to argue that there is no way for us to achieve being the healthiest nation until we have a system with everyone in and nobody out. Because it's leaky. You know, it's leaky in a variety of ways. Secondly, um, we focus a lot um, on acute care. 
Now, this is, this is the place to be. Uh, if you crash your, your Dodge, um, if you fall off a roof, uh, if you um, have a chronic disease and you get very sick, um, this is absolutely the place to be for that. No question about that. This is the nation that I want to be at if I get sick. The only challenge is that we really don't invest in the stuff that really makes a difference. You know, one of the things about um, being an emergency physician is that it's real clear to me when we have politicians who say, well, we have universal coverage because we have emergency departments. And as an emergency physician, why I tell you that is quite flattering to hear. Um, there are things that I know as a practicing or formerly practicing emergency physician um, that I can't do with all of the bells and whistles and tools and medications that I have. If you come in with a um, anaphylactic shock, I can save your life and bring you back. Tragically, if you come in with a, a hole in your chest, a gunshot wound, a severe fall, I can, I can often fix that. Not always, but I can often fix that. But what I can't do as an emergency physician is fix the things that really kill people. You know, I can't fix a little bit of diabetes, a little elevated blood sugar, a little elevated high blood pressure. Um, you know, all the kinds of things that result in early amputations and end-stage renal disease and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. I can't fix that no matter how many times you come into the emergency department. Only a comprehensive primary care system with everyone in and nobody out can fix that and make that better. So I dispute um, when I hear folks say that having an emergency department and a wonderful safety net um, system is the way to go. Third, we have one of the most complex service delivery systems uh, in the world. It's also manifested by the most complex payment system in the world. And I used to marvel as a state health commissioner in Maryland, and we had our dual eligibles, and we spent lots of time and money reconciling the federal dollar from the left pocket to the right pocket. It was an art form. We were very good at it. Um, and we got penalized if we didn't do it very well. And yet, it was simply was moving the pot money from one pocket to another. Um, I'm sure for some bureaucratic reason it had to be reconciled. Um, but I got to tell you, it made the system much more complex. And if you just think about what we do as a health system, where everybody in the health system's fundamental goal is to figure out how to get somebody else to pay for it, and then we craft amazing administrative systems, the most complex budgetary systems in the world, to make that happen. And then we tell you about it through your benefit thing you get every time you use a, um, a health service. We tell you we charge you too much for a service that we really didn't mean to charge you for. Uh, and then everybody except the uninsured gets a big, deep discount for that service. But it's complex, and that's something else we need to think about how we do it um, in our system. And then, you know, we have not utilized any of the tools that the banking system uses. Um, I'm always amazed that I can get money, and I have done this, just about anywhere on the planet when I travel, out of an ATM, and yet we can't move an electrocardiogram in many places across the street in an organized and timely way. Um, I was in Geneva, and we couldn't find a, a taxi, so we got the little Uber app out, and there we go. We got back to the hotel pretty easily, uh, and yet trying to make an appointment for many of our healthcare systems is a work of art. Um, complex system we need to do something about. And the other thing I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about today, uh, a real inadequate focus on the social determinants of health. So of course, why is that important? So Mike McGinnis told us this. Uh, Mike uh, uh, is a former public health service officer who's now at the National Academy of Medicine, formerly the Institute of Medicine. He and his colleagues pointed out the things that really kill people. Um, and they grouped them differently from the disease processes that we historically have said. That does not mean that cardiovascular disease and cancer um, uh, and diabetes and chronic pulmonary disease aren't the leading causes of death. They still are. 
But when you think about the root causes, um, it turns out that health care is only about 10 percent uh, of what actually makes people healthy if you go back to that original definition from the World Health Organization. It's only about 10 percent, and that's painful for clinicians to, to see um, because extraordinarily that 10 percent is very valuable if you're sick, and we play an enormous role to ensure around prevention and wellness, but we are failing in our, um, our work as clinicians, as health professionals, because we don't spend enough time addressing the other parts uh, of this diagram that are important to the health and well-being. And it manifests itself in interesting ways, and again, we're going to focus on death because it's, we can't dispute it in most cases. Uh, matter of fact, I only know of one situation where that wasn't absolute. So the difference is in mortality um, based on where you live, and um, they can be enormous. And you could try to explain some of that, the fact that, you know, um, healthy, wealthy snowbirds go to Florida and live. Um, you know, they wait till they're 70 and they live till they're 90 and they live in Florida, and that's why the, the um, uh, 81 years of age is the um, uh, life expectancy there. But that, that's not really the reason. Um, there are reasons for that, and we know because um, clearly that place matters. And we now know that it's your zip code um, that probably matters the most because it determines access to a whole range of critical services that you actually need that make you healthy. Um, high quality schools, employment, um, healthy housing, food, um, public transport, really quality health care makes a difference. Uh, social cohesion, social capital in the community, um, all of these things are important uh, as we think about it, and, you, and there are things that happen where you live that make a difference. I like to show this map uh, because it's uh, Washington, D.C., and I just want you to know that, um, you know, as you can see, there's an enormous difference uh, around the Washington, D.C. Beltway. Uh, I live up there um, where the, about where it says 84 uh, years of life, which is why I do anything that I want because I know I'm guaranteed to be around at least <laughs> until I'm 84. No, but seriously, um, enormous life expectancy. I mean, that's a, only a 15, 20 mile difference between um, down there in Maryland at 78 uh, and up there in, in uh, um, Montgomery County, Maryland, where I live at 84 years of age. That's an enormous difference in life expectancy. For those who might not be schooled in this, a year or two of life expectancy is a big deal um, from a public health perspective. It is a big deal. Um, and, and it makes a big difference. And actually, if you think about where you live here, um, I went online and looked at the, the U.S. News and World Report. They did a, um, a, a ranking of counties. Um, and your county where you live uh, is about a year, year and a half um, life expectancy less than the national average. Um, and interestingly enough, you're better than the counties directly around you um, where you have about a one year uh, advantage on them, just um, in terms of looking at numbers. Uh, so it, it's a big deal about where you live. And w we've all seen this. So this is actually Delmar Boulevard in St. Louis, Missouri. And it's a great graph because um, it illustrates something that we all know, two communities, separated by a street. Sometimes it's separated by a railroad track. Sometimes it's separated by a major highway, but every community has one of these, where everybody who's on one side of the community can look across the street or the track or the expressway to the other side of the community, and you know their enormous differences. You can see the differences. Um, you know who lives there. You know what the economics in that community is. You know about um, where the assets are in those communities. Some, you know, your community is much better than, in terms of assets in their community. And you know that the life expectancy and health and well-being of those two communities um, are very different. So it's something we need to pay uh, a lot more attention to uh, as, as we go forward. So with that in mind, um, you know, we know that health is certainly about risky behavior. Um, that's certainly on the behavior component of that. Um, tobacco and utilization still is a leading preventable cause of death in the country. Uh, there aren't very many um, industries that I describe as evil 
and duplicative and not supporting health, but the tobacco industry is one of those industries. Um, I don't demonize too many industries, but yeah, tobacco is one of them. Uh, it's a challenge. Um, they will argue that it's an adult behavior, and yes, it is, but almost everyone who smokes starts smoking um, in their youth. Uh, as we've begun rising, um, the, um, because of things we've put in place um, and put barriers to young folks getting tobacco, um, the industry continued to come up clever ways in which to reverse that. And so just when we thought we were about to, even though we've had dramatic reductions in tobacco utilization in youth, uh, they found a new way to do it with e-cigarettes. Fascinating. They've now renormalized the behavior because smoking is both a behavioral issue as well as a chemical addiction. Um, and they argue that, well, the addiction part isn't too bad. But it is. Uh, but it is about risky behavior, and we need to do a lot more around this, um, this issue um, as we try to reduce tobacco utilization. Uh, again, leading preventable cause of death in our nation. We know that health is about equitable access to affordable, nutritious foods. The key words are equitable and affordable. So I had a chance to do a sabbatical up in New York, and um, anyone who's been to New York knows that um, certainly in Manhattan, uh, which is my frame of reference for this, for this point, um, that almost every other corner has one of those food carts where they serve food. And um, they also have lots of grocery stores uh, in the wealthy parts of town, and it's hard to find fast food. So the six months I was there on the sabbatical, I went through McDonald's, Burger King, um, withdrawal because it was hard to find it. I, had to, I was forced to eat fresh fruits and vegetables and nutritious foods for a whole six months. It was, it was terrible. I just want you to know that. <laughs> um, but I was, I was saved because on every corner they had those carts. So if, when I ever got out there, I'd say, ah, okay, I'll cheat today. I could go out and find one of those carts. And whether those, those, those foods were nutritious um, or not, we'll, we'll debate. Um, they probably weren't as healthy as they ought to be. Uh, but, again, that's, that's for another day. But one of the interesting things in New York, what they did, was they decided they were going to increase the number of permits for people doing these food carts. And they actually almost had 1,000 new permits they were going to put out. And, of course, everybody was competing for them. The health department weighed in and said, if you're going to do this, what we need to do is only permit people who are going to have carts. They're going to go into places that don't have fresh fruits and vegetables. Uh, and sell them. And they did that, called the green card experiment. It's been well evaluated, and it turns out um, that they were able to get rid of a couple myths. Myth number one was that low-income individuals would not eat healthy foods. They were able to show that consumption of fruit and vegetables went up in those communities when they put those carts there. But all they could sell were fresh fruits and vegetables, by the way. Um, second thing was that they, would, they could afford them, but of course, they had to be affordable, and they had to be fresh. Uh, if you did that, then people in any community, particularly low-income communities, will eat more fresh fruits and vegetables. And they were able to begin addressing some of the food desert issues around fresh fruits and vegetables, at least, uh, in those communities. Um, but it is a challenge. It continues to be a challenge. When I was in Washington, D.C. as a health officer, um, in the poorest part of town, Ward 8, until fairly recently, there was not a grocery store on that part of town. Um, for many years, there was no grocery store in that part of town. And the argument, of course, was that, um, you know, they, the stores couldn't make a, couldn't make a buck. Um, but they've now been able to make, work that out, and I'm pleased to say that they do have um, at least one grocery store over on the east side of, the, of Washington, D.C. We know that health is about what we eat um, and how much of it. Um, you know, sugary beverages are, are a big deal. Um, when I was growing up, um, um, I remember um, getting a small soda. Uh, a large soda was probably what we would now call a medium soda. And, um, um, but getting a small soda was the norm. Uh, and now we've gone from, you know, basically six ounces to eight ounces to 16 ounces to 64 ounces, and we think that's progress. Um, it's a challenge. And it, these empty calories have become the mainstay. The days when we would drink water and milk 
um, with all of our meals and Kool-Aid on, uh, on um, when parents were trying to give us a treat uh, have now changed to basically the staple of our liquid consumption uh, our sugary beverages in many communities, and that's a challenge. Uh, and we've got to figure out more and more ways to try to address that. We are beginning to see efforts around um, soda taxes and others that are beginning to take hold that initially I was skeptical would, um, even though they work for tobacco, I was skeptical they would work for sugary beverages. But it looks like they do. They certainly raise money. Uh, and it turns out that kids are relatively, are really price sensitive. Um, so it, it, it may work, and we need to continue to, to experiment with those and other ways to reduce um, uh, calories and the consumption of sugary beverages. We know that health is about external and internal stressors. Now I want you to think about this. You know, there are many places where you have populations of people who um, are, have the same insurance, have the same income, and yet high blood pressure um, and other um, disease processes that are endocrine modulated um, result in differences in health outcomes. How other than you explain um, high blood pressure in African American men, um, again, who are making the same amount of money and live in affluent communities uh, other than stress? Um, it's, it's important to think about that because particularly in today, um, in terms of the environment that we're in with so much hate being talked around, um, it's, it's a stressor. And if you don't think it matters, um, I can just tell you that after the last shooting, um, I had people on my staff, I had to make phone calls to people on my staff, um, both Jewish members of my staff and non-Jewish members of my staff who were just beside themselves, um, worried about coming to work. Uh, and we've certainly recognized that the American Public Health Association as an entity is a safe place to be. Uh, and yet people are just afraid. Um, and we've got to lower, we've got to figure out how we lower that, uh, that issue around stress. That's one thing. We also have to figure out how we get, deal with this other stress that we call multitasking. Um, because we're all doing it, uh, and yet it's a stressful function. Um, and the demands on people each and every day uh, have an impact on our health, and we need to pay a lot more attention to that, um, both as we design workplaces and workflow, um, family life and others, uh, as a way of trying to address these issues, uh, recognizing there's a, there's a physiological function that occurs um, when you get stressed. Endocrine levels go up, they change, uh, and they have an impact on our health. That's particularly important for kids, with early trauma. Um, children who have early trauma, don't do as well in school, um, have a higher incidence of obesity, have a higher incidence of addiction. Uh, we don't understand all the reasons why those things occur, uh, but we do know it's due to a range of early uh, stresses that they've had uh, as children. We know health is about ensuring safe food. Um, we increasingly have um, an environment where uh, the food used to come, well, the food used to come from a single farm, a single cow, um, to your table. A uh, hamburger was a hamburger, and someone got sick, you could probably trace it back uh, to its original source. Nowadays, of course, um, lots of our food is global. Um, my, my favorite vegetable, which is pizza, um, <laughs> you know, the, the meat comes from one place, the bread from someplace else, tomato sauce from someplace else, the cheese from someplace else, and more and more our foods, our combination foods, we're seeing um, the food sources are from multiple places. So if you have a foodborne outbreak, it's really tough to trace, really, really tough to trace. Um, we relish clean water. It's important to understand there are parts of the world that are challenged with clean water, um, and that's a big issue. And we need to pay a, a lot more attention um, to water um, as an essential food source. Um, because we also know what happens when we get unsafe water. I'll park the political issues that occurred in Flint, Michigan aside. Um, but it tells you a lot about our core basic infrastructure um, uh, in our communities. We take great care um, in many ways that all we have to do to get water is just 
turn the knob. We're quite comfortable in doing that uh, each and every day. We don't think anything about it. But when we have a water outage in the community and it's out for too long, we get lots of complaints about it. Um, we need water. Uh, and far too often our systems are, are, are a problem. And, you know, lead in, the, in Flint is certainly, uh, a, was a, certainly a serious problem, but all of our central cities are getting old. Uh, and that's a challenge. And we have not paid a lot of attention to that uh, as we go forward. Um, poor air quality. Uh, I, I just point this out because there is some regression on, on, on our environment. The reason we had the Clean Water Act and Clean Air Act is because we were very much concerned about um, water. We were also very much concerned about clean air. There was a time in this country um, where you couldn't go outside in a place like Los Angeles and jog um, because of the, the, the ozone in the air, the air quality. In fact, you had to put something over your mouth because you get stuff in your teeth if you went out in that air. Now, we've done a good deal about trying to clean that up. And many of our, uh, our um, communities um, that were coal mining communities, um, you had uh, particulate matter in the air. Places where they had lots of factories, particulate matter in the air. We've done a good job through a regulatory process to make sure that we've improved the air quality in our community. But it makes a big difference. You know, children that live off of expressways have a higher incidence of lung dysfunctions, higher incidence of asthma, and other pulmonary, reactive pulmonary disease than children that live two miles away from those, um, those expressways. Um, there's a fascinating study was done during the Atlanta Olympics where they, um, uh, as some of you may know, they, they raised uh, the poor part of the community and built the new park and, and everything. And, um, they, the Olympics came, and of course, one of the things that happens when you bring the Olympics is you limit traffic. So someone was clever and decided to do a study, and they looked at um, the managed care um, uh, visits for that community, because they could control for those, and they looked at emergency department visits. And it turned out that when the cars weren't there, they had a precipitous drop in respiratory disease and respiratory-related conditions, where all other things like heart attacks and things like that stayed the same. And what do you think happened when the cars came back? Respiratory conditions came back. What that tells you is that um, addressing air pollution has an immediate impact on our health. And reversing the controls we have on air pollution also has an immediate return on, of um, negative impact on our health. So it's, it's an important thing to understand how important this is uh, if we're truly going to get about um, being a healthy community. Health is where we dump our trash. Um, you know, we do some interesting things. We always um, dump our trash in the parts of the community that um, the land is not as valuable. And then for some other reason, some economic reason, that land suddenly becomes valuable. Sometimes they clean it up real well and put million dollars homes on it. And sometimes they don't clean it up real well. Um, sometimes they don't clean it up real well and they put um, homes for low-income folks on that property. Um, so it's a challenge. And then all the numbers of people who are in communities um, where the trash is just simply dumped uh, each and every day and not properly cleaned up. Um, when I was at, back in D.C. as a health officer, um, we did, I think, an important public health intervention because what used to happen um, is that um, the 14th Street Bridge is a bridge that connects Northern Virginia to downtown Washington, D.C. Uh, in fact, sitting on the bridge, you can actually see the White House and on the Washington Monument and all the beautiful monuments in the city. Um, but at night, these trash hauls would come in from Northern Virginia and they would come across the bridge and they would turn right. Turn right means they went into the lower income part of town and they would dump their trash. So lots of illegal hauling and dumping. So public health intervention that we had was to put police on that bridge to either arrest them or turn them around um, as a way of dissuading them from coming into the city. Now, why they never went left in the Georgetown, into the ritzy part of town, I don't know. We'll leave that for um, the after speech, drinks, and discussion, um, because that's political. Um, but they went into the part of town, obviously, where they wouldn't get caught, and they thought there was lots of vacant land where they thought they could dump their trash. And that's a, that's a big challenge. Uh, that, that's a big challenge. We've we got to do a lot better. Um, and recycling is important, but not enough. 
uh, in terms of figuring out how we handle the trash that we put out each and every day. You know, health is about climate change. Uh, climate change is here. It's impacting our health today. Um, it is definitely involved in causing more severe storms. Uh, no one's going to tell you that any particular storm is, late, is caused by climate change. But there's no question that the storm's frequency and ferocity is due to the warmer weather that we're having. Whether it's warm weather or wet or snowstorms, it's all related to climate change. And so we've got to think a lot more productively about where we build, how we build, um, how we live in terms of energy conservation. Um, those are important things that we've got to do, and the public health community needs to be more involved uh, in those discussions from a health perspective. It also means that we need to enhance our emergency preparedness in many, many different ways than we've done in the past. Um, Nadine and I were talking about this um, um, earlier this afternoon about the, the essential nature of this. Uh, we all talk about being prepared for 72 hours, uh, but the recent experiences, both in, in Florida and Texas and certainly in Puerto Rico, tell us that 72 hours being on your own is probably not long enough. Um, it may be three weeks, two weeks, three weeks that you're really going to be on your own. And we've got to figure out how we deal with that uh, in, a, in a society where if the, if the um, electricity goes out for four hours, we're apoplectic and on our phones complaining to somebody. You know, the world's going to come to an end because our power is out for four hours. Imagine it being out for two weeks. Uh, those are big challenges that we have to address. I started talking earlier about the issue around critical infrastructure. Um, anybody doesn't think this is a health issue when people die, when a bridge collapsed. Well, we are not investing in the critical infrastructure. Uh, again, as an ER doc raising my hand concerned about trauma, we need to be more concerned about this. We need to figure out how we're going to pay to both inspect our bridges, fix our bridges, uh, and also other parts of our critical infrastructure. Uh, otherwise, we're going to have more and more of these kinds of uh, calamities that happen each and every day. And one would argue that, you know, these are acts of God. No, they're not. They're preventable. Um, it's man's failure to, um, to address these things each and every day in terms of infrastructure. We know that education is important. Um, and it's important because um, we know that uh, babies born to a mother who did not finish high school are nearly twice as likely to die before their first birthday as babies born to college graduates. Um, and you can see that here and here. Now, this has been looked at, interestingly enough, in almost every society that's looked at it around the world, regardless of the fundamental economics of their society, whether they are um, a developing nation, um, a mid-income nation, or a, um, um, or a high-income nation, this correlation is so Well, this is a, I don't know what it's called, but as a surrogate for something else going on in the community is not clear, but education makes a difference. We know that um, people who graduate from high school on time do better from a health perspective than people who do not. Health is about where we build and how we build. You know, having sidewalks that are walkable and bikeable and green um, are important, and we need to spend more time thinking about the built environment. We're now beginning to reinvest in our central cities. I understand you're beginning to do that here, um, in reinvesting in your downtown. I think that's a good thing. Um, those central cities are important because they were originally designed to be walkable. They were originally designed for people to live in those central cities. Um, uh, and it does not mean you can't do these in the, in the suburbs as well. I still live in a suburb that even though we have sidewalks, we bus our kids to school. Um, so think about that. You know, there are many places in this country where the kids can see the school, but they can't walk or ride their bike to the school. So we put them in a bus, spewing all kinds of stuff out the tailpipe. They have to get up hours earlier to get to school. Uh, it's a real challenge, and we need to, we need to figure out how we deal with that um, more effectively. We know that health is about places to play. Um, now, we had a big fight with members, some members of Congress over this because um, um, we wanted to use prevention fund dollars to try to invest in community wellness and um, actually to do some things on playgrounds. Uh, and they told, this was, they told us this was not health, and health dollars should not be used to do this. And the more interesting thing is that we know very clearly that children who are in organized play 
have better school performance, have better mental health, and certainly have better physical fitness. I would argue that every dime we put in organized play for kids is a public health intervention and is good for the nation. Now, I prefer to spend someone else's money doing it, but we can spend our money as well. We know transportation is a big deal. You know, I, again, I living in the Washington, D.C. area, every time we overbuild a little further out, we build a larger and wider expressway um, to get there. And we've got to stop this. We've got to start shifting from a model that moves cars as our determinant to a model that moves people with health as a co-benefit. Uh, and that's a challenge. There's too many expressways um, that we're building and, and not enough in public transit um, which we know is good um, for economic well-being, and we also know is good for the health and well-being of the community. We know that health is about equitable access to quality, affordable housing. Um, I won't do a live poll tonight, but I suspect if I did a live poll, I would guess that the majority of you would want to live in the house on the right, and few of you would probably want to live in the house on the left. Um, the hazards of living in the house on the left are obvious. Uh, it's older. It's probably got lots of lead paint in it. It's probably got lots of vermin in it. Um, if you're a child with asthma uh, and it has roaches, um, that gives you a higher instance of having uh, an asthma attack and all the injury that will occur uh, in that house uh, is a real challenge. Um, and we still have people living in facilities like that, uh, which is a challenge. Something I hadn't thought about is the fact that we actually have a broadband um, deserts in this country. There are places where you can't get broadband. And I'm not just talking about those places that are irritating where your cell doesn't connect very well. Um, but now we've moved to an environment where all of our kids are doing, um, regardless of income, are doing their work on computers. They've got to draw everything down on an electronic device. They get their homework on electronic devices. In some places they get their books on electronic device. Uh, and yet when they go home, they don't have access to broadband. There are kids, of course, who go to lots of places. They sit out their favorite coffee shop. They sit out. Some even ride the bus around because they know where all the hot spots are um, to get their homework done. Um, get home a little later. Certainly not very efficient, uh, but it's a challenge. And I would suspect if you mapped, because I actually know the answer to this question, these broadband deserts over communities of need, surprise, surprise, they map right over to each other, pretty close proximity. Um, so there actually was an FCC, I don't know if the effort's still going on, effort to try to get the health, connect with the public health community um, to use um, and for advocacy purposes, help build the broadband uh, networks in those communities and as a tool, uh, ultimately, to try to improve the health and well-being of those communities. And that's something we ought to pay a lot more attention to. Being, being uh, in Appalachia and talking about income inequality is uh, um, something that I think you, you, your colleagues and some of your neighbors understand very well. Um, I don't have anything about people getting a lot of money. One of these days, I work real hard um, and I probably invent something. I might be part of the 1%. Um, but the in income inequality we have, we have so many people um, who are not just living paycheck to paycheck, but not living paycheck to paycheck. They simply can't pay their bills. Um, so many people that are one paycheck away from total ruin. Um, we've got to deal with this issue of income inequality. We know very clearly that, that health and wealth are correly, uh, strongly correlated. Um, and as a public health community, there are things we can do to engage um, in this discussion uh, to deal with income inequality. And we just haven't done it because we think it's, you know, the P word. It's too political. Um, but it isn't. Uh, it's an important issue that we need to address. You know, I talked about broad community um, capacity around having safe and violent free communities already. Um, but having communities where lots of parks and open space that are walkable and bikeable, someplace you can go when somebody gets on your last nerve. And I just want you to think for a minute who that was the last time they did it. Um, because when what you did, you, you probably just needed to get away. 
um, from that person and um, try to address the needs that you have. So I think the essential goal we have in terms of building healthy communities is also about building community resilience. Again, I like definitions. This is the HHS definition of community resilience. Um, these are the assets that are in that community to help um, improve the health and well-being of that community, but more importantly, um, help the community withstand and adapt and recover from adversity, whether it's a storm or a flood um, or violent activity. Um, resilience is a very important part uh, of that effort um, in, in every community. We need to think more and more how we do that, um, but we know how to do it. Um, we know it by building across sectors to improve health. In fact, we now know very clearly that doing multi-sectorial work, bringing health and the, you know, the private business community together, the economic development community together, the transportation community together, the environment community together, housing, education, to work on a single problem in a collaborative way dramatically improves um, the success of a project and their long life. Those projects work, uh, those communities develop trust, and they work together to solve very important problems, um, not just in the health arena, but way upstream to try to address that. Um, it also helps build strong families and community networks because um, social capital in community, which we seem to have lost um, because people don't know their neighbors, they're not getting out, they're not talking to one another. Yeah, they have a barbecue, but all the people in the barbecue had to drive into the community. Um, so the real challenges in trying to build these strong community networks, and we need to do more and more of that um, uh, as we go forward. And we have to find ways, again, to walk across sectors. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a, a quick case study, and this is fictitious, but it's an opportunity for us to think about what if we build our health systems to support community resilience. Um, and for my, my case, I'm going to um, tell you asthma, a very common clinical condition. Um, it's clearly something that's... Um, the people that have it, they're environmentally sensitive. Uh, minorities are disproportionately impacted um, by this um, clinical problem. Uh, it is a significant barrier to children going to school, particularly when they have bad asthma. Um, but if you really want to address it from a clinical perspective, you've got to not just treat the asthma, but you've got to figure out what some of the root causes of that asthma. Um, and if you do that, you can actually craft broad solutions to address both. So imagine a future. Um, where we treat asthma and other chronic diseases like we do infectious diseases. So um, right now, you know, if you had um, 15 cases of measles, um, we would address that um, in, in a certain way from a public health perspective. Uh, and we have systems to make us know that um, we have a, a measles outbreak. Um, so imagine this happened um, on a particular day in a particular community, we had um, four hospitals, emergency departments. Um, one where you had a case that came in, another one that had two cases, one four and one three cases. Um, and these are all kids who um, went to schools in the same area. And, um, you know, on this particular day, each individual entity would see this as a small number of cases. It wouldn't raise anybody's index of suspicion because a kid came in with severe asthma on a particular day. Um, but if you lump them together, um, you have what I would call a cluster um, of an outbreak on that day. So imagine a situation where you bring the public health department in, the system is designed to do that, and they do the classic epidemiologic investigation. Um, they know from the school because the school has reported that all these kids were out on the same day. And, um, they looked around, they know the kids lived in different neighborhoods, they lived in different homes, they, did, they went into their homes, they looked for triggers for asthma. Um, but while they found some things, they didn't find anything that would argue for all these kids getting sick on the same day. Um, but we do know that it all resulted in significant enough asthma, they were all out of school for that day and had to go to the emergency department for treatment. And again, no single hospital or insurer would have ever picked this up. Uh, had they not done the um, epidemiologic look. So after a really good look, and because we're really good at what we do, um, we found out that all these kids rode, rode on the same school bus to school. And the school bus has a broken tailpipe. Broken tailpipe, 
noxic fumes, exacerbation of asthma. Okay? And I would love to say the public health department here are the heroes. We're partners in making this happen. But the real hero of the day, the real hero of our story, is the bus mechanic. Because the bus mechanic fixes that tailpipe and then goes and inspects all the other buses, fixes a few more tailpipes, found a couple funny brakes, other safety issues on the buses, so now our buses are much safer. Um, and if you think about this, you now have a system that used the schools um, and ultimately reduced ER visits, saved money, improved the health, reduced disparities in this particular community, um, reduced school absenteeism, and clearly made the transportation system safer because we work more collaboratively together by identifying a health issue and addressing it in a population health way uh, to address this. And then if you want to go further, then you think about what policies you can put in place if there's any regulation that needs to be strengthened or laws that need to be passed to make this something that can be addressed region-wide, statewide, so this doesn't happen again. Um, this is the way we need to begin thinking about addressing things to ultimately improve the health and well-being of our community. I think it's important that um, what we tr I'm trying to describe is a system where prevention and population health becomes a shared value, where every segment of our society sees public health is their secondary job, whether you're picking up the trash, because if you don't pick up the trash, you're going to have a public health problem. Because if you fix the pipes, because if you don't fix the pipes right, you're going to have a public health problem. Because in the schools, if the kids aren't being educated, you're going to have a public health problem. Um, if you're in housing, uh, if you don't get the lead out of those homes, you're going to have a public health problem. And those kids who have brain damage from that lead will have a whole range of things, uh, including around impulse control, um, which ultimately results in, a, again, a range of activities uh, and behaviors that are undesirable in our society. So we need to think more and more across sectors, addressing the social determinants of health in a much more aggressive way than we've done each and every day um, for the rest of our lives. Um, and I, I think until we do that, we're going to continue to spend twice as much as any industrialized nation and die sooner. With that, I thank you, and uh, I'll be happy to take any questions that you might have. There you go. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for that very wonderful presentation. I'm just curious about the tobacco 21 policy. What is it going by? Sorry, what the again? Tobacco 21 policy. Yeah, we, we're supporting um, raising the, the age to, to, to 21 and certainly have advocated for it. Um, for those of you who might not know, the idea of raising the, the minimum age of it being able to smoke up to 21. We think that would make a big deal. The National Academy of Medicine uh, proved that that's an important policy that would be effective, and we strongly support it. Now, whether or not we can get that through Congress um, uh, remains to be seen, but we're certainly very supportive of it. Yeah. The way that they're sneaking into the kids, how can they still advertise to children with that, or is there less regulation? Or what, how exactly are they able to get it to kids more than normal tobacco? Yeah, well, well, they argue that it's not a tobacco delivery device; uh, it's a nicotine delivery device, and they would argue that it's outside the purview of the laws around tobacco. Um, the FDA has very recently said that um, they're going to regulate e-cigarettes. Um, as a drug delivery device and as so um, not allow kids to use them legally. Uh, I forgot what age, I don't know if 18 or 21, but, but, but not allowing kids, youth to use them. Um, and uh, 
but just understand that, that these small companies initially develop um, argue pretty strongly that they're warming it and therefore it's not combustible. Um, that nicotine, while addictive, is no more um, troubling than coffee um, or a couple drinks. And we know that in children, uh, nicotine um, is a real problem for the developing brain, which is how the FDA was able to make, make their argument. Um, it is terribly addicting. It's one of the most addicting substances that we have. In and it itself may not cause cancer, but it's all the other stuff that gets burned with it. And just like in the early years of tobacco control, um, we don't know what's in those things. We don't, you know, there's, we've not seen the science, because it's not public, uh, of what's in it. And it wasn't until we got the tobacco papers that we could really get a, a feel for the science that had been done and the fact that they absolutely knew on combustible tobacco now um, how to dick more people, adding flavors to it because they knew that certain populations would do it, um, strongly figuring out the marketing. Uh, and those of you who are not my age, um, as you look at the, the, from a historical perspective, you look at the e-cigarette stuff that's going on right now, um, that's exactly the way they did tobacco. They just took the tobacco playbook, kind of dusted it off, lined out to combustible tobacco, and put in uh, e-cigarettes. Uh, initially, it looked like cigarettes. You know, you bought them, they looked like, like, a, like a cigarette. Uh, and now, of course, they, they look at it like a USB drive. Um, and then they say they don't, they're not trying to sell them to kids. I don't know how many adults want to snort and vape on a USB drive, but I know lots of kids who want to do that. Thank you. I was just wondering if you were familiar with the typhus outbreak that's occurring in LA. And I, I just hear a little bit about it from the news and didn't know if you could be able to elaborate at all and what's no. possible. No, no, I, I'm not familiar with the typhus outbreak in LA. Although I probably should be since the APHA meetings in San Diego in a few weeks. So. <laughs> I have been paying attention to the hepatitis A outbreaks that are going on, but no, I missed that one. Okay, two Yeah, I, I, think, I think it's important to remind people that, that the air, um, you know, doesn't respect um, political boundaries or geographic boundaries. And so, um, at least from an air perspective, you will. Stay tuned. And if you don't think you're going to be impacted by some big storm, uh, I just want to point out the one that just came through Florida that went up through South Carolina and North Carolina and hit communities that are not coastal, that have not had the kind of wind damage, storm damage, uh, or flooding, uh, other than you know, torrential rains that are normally flooded in the past. So um, it's coming your way. And um, I, I think the best thing to do is, first of all, when I come to town, they know exactly what I'm going to say. And I try to encourage people to get the quote unquote the unanticipated messenger. Um, so encouraging um, uh, Mrs. Jones on the corner, um, who's a voter, to go see them. Um, you can go with them. Um, but get to know your elected officials. Um, however your relationships with them are, get to know them, share the information with them, um, do local visits, tell them your concerns. Um, they will listen. Uh, and um, 
you know, at the end of the day, I always tell people, and this is not a political message, um, because APHA is a 501c3 and we're nonpartisan, um, <laughs> but voting is not partisan. And so at the end of the day, um, vote, vote your, your wishes and your dreams just as you would always vote. And um, um, when I go see my elected officials, I remind them of that. In my own, you know, in my community, I remind them each and every day um, about what my priorities are. And I write them letters about it. And, um, you know, and, and hopefully I, I like to think I'm a little bit influential, at least for the ones that I vote for. That help? Hi, thanks for the presentation. I'm just really wondering what, if you have any viewpoint on where health information exchanges are going. I thought your example of getting a medical record from your out of the yeah. country is a great one. Yeah, they're, they're, they're getting better. And we actually, the, the, the whole issue of health um, exchanges are, are getting much better. Um, HIPAA doesn't get in the way, well, HIPAA's, HIPAA's not an absolute barrier, but it is a challenge. Um, and for sure, because there are lots of rules around HIPAA um, that um, we, we probably need to go back and look and figure out how to make that work. Uh, I know that people are, um, granted, we got people hacking into stuff all the time, but you know, the, the banks are pretty secure, and I would argue that our health records are pretty secure as well. Um, and um, th there are ways to allow people to exchange information, critical business partners, et cetera. Um, I, so as, as an ER doc, I, I didn't need the medical record this thing. I, I, I really didn't. I needed to know chief complaint, medication list, you know, ad, ad, adequate list of their chief complaint, adequate list of their medical problems, adequate list of their, um, their medications, maybe some recent hospitalizations, um, maybe major surgeries. Um, I, don't, I really didn't need to know if their toe was splinted because it was broken. Um, but I needed to know if they had an appendicitis or, you know, in the past and had an epidectomy or, um, you know, um, other internal surgery, et cetera. Um, and yet there's this, there's this desire to give you more information than you know what to do with. Uh, and so increasingly um, we need to figure out what information clinicians need to make decisions right away, um, build systems that allow them to do that, um, recognize that the medical information is yours. Uh, now, I understand there's a proprietary issue here around the physician's record and their notes and all that. Um, but, but at the end of the day, you ought to be able to do that. And increasingly, it's getting better. So I, you know, I was able to, um, two, two quick stories. One, I um, wanted to get my flu shot because of our big annual meeting. And um, normally, we get it done at the office, but I was out traveling somewhere. Couldn't get it done. So I went to um, CVS, not a commercial for CVS, but I did go to CVS. And um, they have a, you know, a walk-in clinic there. And I went to walk in. And I needed to get my shingle shot, because I'm over 65. And I wanted to get a flu shot. And the answer was um, I needed to make an appointment to get the shingle shot done, which I did. Um, and she couldn't sneak me in um, to get my flu shot. She was booked. So I just walked 10 steps over to the pharmacy and got my flu shot. In and out 15 minutes, my medical record went to my doctor. Um, I was already in their system because I must have got a prescription there at some point. Um, and it, that worked real well for me. Um, so we have systems that do work. If you're in Kaiser Permanente, again, not a commercial for Kaiser, um, but they have, a, they, have a, they have a process of no wrong door. So if you go into the dermatologist's office and you haven't had your colonoscopy or mammography or your flu shot, that, that receptionist is going to ask you about that. And if it's something that can happen that day, they make it happen. If it's something, and you have time and make it happen. If not, they get you the appointment to get them in and get it done. Um, no wrong door. Right now, in our fractionated system, in most systems that are not really well integrated, um, yeah, they tell you, yeah, you need to get your flu shot if they pick it up. And then you got to call and, you know, arrange it and all that stuff. So we need a system that's seamless like that. Um, and um, so we're getting better at it, um, but it's going to take some 22-year-old um, who Uberizes healthcare um, to make us listen. All right, one last question. Uh, join me in another round of applause. Thank you. Oh, okay.